Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Nice to see you tonight. Amen. Amen. Something I want you to pray about. I've been thinking about it. Um, as I see it on Wednesday night, sometimes people not coming. Um, I want you to pray whether we should shut down Facebook on Wednesday night. People are staying home and watching. Um, I, I think it's detrimental. It can have its it can have its gains, but it can also have its negatives. And uh, if I start seeing more people being absent and just watching on 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 the uh, on the uh, Facebook, I'm going to shut it down on Wednesdays, um, so that um, uh, people will start coming back to church. Amen. Praise the Lord. So keep that in prayer. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about interpreting narratives. I think we got one more lesson after this, and then we'll be finished. And then we're going to seek the Lord on Wednesday night. Amen? Praise God. Monday nights have been fantastic. So Wednesday night we're going to seek the Lord for a couple of Wednesdays. So we may not be on Facebook for a couple of Wednesday nights. We're going to seek God. And see what he has for Wednesday nights. Um, maybe we'll get into a short study. Maybe we'll get into something else. I'm not sure. But if you have your Bibles with you, get ready. We're going to be uh, opening up to some scripture. But I want to talk about tonight about interpreting narratives. And I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. I know that may be a sad news for you up in Maine and also Sajiv in India. But uh, we have to think of the local body first. Um, and so um, that's something I've been kind of been noticing a little bit lately, and um, we'll see where it goes. Amen. You know, when when we ever uh, when we ever have um, a move like we're having on Monday nights, um, there's a price to pay to be paid, and the enemy's not going to just sit back. He's been attacking. He's been attacking in different ways. Um, uh, some of the things we're trying to get straightened out, and um, some uh, some people are being dis uh, well, not people, but one person is being disciplined right now, and hopefully, um, you know, that person will get their life together, and will come back to church. We want them to come back to church. We 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 have open arms for them, for for that person, and uh, but we have to take a stand. It's not a popular stand, but. We have to take a stand, and, uh, you know, I told the person, I said, listen, when you repent and you're serious, our arms are open for you, we love you, we want you back, but you can't keep coming the way you're coming. Uh, it's not right, and it's detrimental to the whole body. If you uh, allow the 11 in the, into the body, you eventually leaven the whole lump. And so uh, we've taken a disciplinary action on that aspect. Um, but we love the person, and we hope that the person repents and comes back soon. Amen. Okay, now enough announcements. Interpreting narratives, and what is the meaning by narratives? Well, when we speak of the narrative portions of the Scripture, we're referring principally to the historical portions of the Scripture. And approximately 35% of the Bible is narrative. And the world, the, uh, this would include a large portion of the Old Testament, especially the historical books, uh, Genesis to Esther, and the first five books of the New Testament. They have to do with history, but they're also anointed by God. They're also uh, narratives. Uh, or, I don't want to say stories because they are true. You know, these are the true narratives. Uh, but it gives a, a, a direction of God's will and purpose as he unfolds it through this narrative. You know, you read about Mary getting pregnant, and you, know, and you hear the story, and then she goes through that and meets Elizabeth. So that's a narrative. And so we're going to learn a little bit about that tonight. In addition, there are a few narrative portions in some of the prophetical books as well, especially in the major prophets, including uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and two of the minor prophets, Jonah and Haggai, and... Uh, also, more narratives in nature. And the word narrative is preferred over the term, as I said, story, because often stories carry the idea of something being fictional or not based on reality. 
you know, oh, he's telling us a story. You know, he's not telling us the truth. Uh, so we want to make sure that we understand that. We must never think of the, of the stories of the Bible as a collection of fairy tales or myths or legends or fables. They are none of those things, and they are inspired words of God handed down to us through the hands of those who chosen writers that he has chosen. And out of the primary faith confession of both Christianity and Judaism is that God has chosen to reveal himself in extraordinary ways uh, in human history, yet in the ordinary events and circumstances in which human beings live and work. You can read that in the Bible of different things that people did for trades. Uh, Paul was a tent maker and how he lived every day. And so it gives you a narrative of some of their lives and what they did so that it can encourage you to see how God worked in their life and how you can apply those principles to your life. What makes narratives unique when it comes to a biblical interpretation? Or what makes the narratives unique when it comes to biblical interpretation? Narratives are records of significant historical events, as we said. I need some water from somebody, please. <clears throat> Uh, the narratives are records of significant historical events, and this includes significant world events. Someone's going to get that for me? Oh, okay. What are some of the significant world events that we read in the Bible? Well, creation, right? That's a significant event that took place. And we know that Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So when we read creation, if you notice, the Bible doesn't set out to prove the existence of God. It believes that God already exists. And so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I don't need to have any more proof than what the Scriptures say because I believe the Scriptures to be authoritative. I don't have to look for extra biblical um, uh, proof that the scriptures are, are true because I believe that they are inspired by God. And, and when Moses penned those first five books of, of the Pentateuch, I believe that they were, he was inspired by God to write about the things that were true. To give you an example, so many times, and I've read in some commentaries, where they don't believe that the story of Jonah and the whale. Okay? But how we can prove that story was true is in the very words of Jesus, because he spoke about Jonah, okay? And he says, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the tomb. So we know that he referred to some historical event that took place as factual. Amen? Because if it wasn't factual and he was using it to approve his own uh, life, what was going to happen, then we would also doubt that also. And then you had the flood. Amen? What was significant about the flood? What can we learn of the narrative of the flood? Well, we can learn from the narrative of the flood that God's judgment will come. But in that judgment, God has mercy. He has grace. For, for Noah found grace in the sight of God. So there are those that even during the time of judgment, God's going to have mercy and grace for those who are humble of heart to receive that grace. Amen? And that, and that uh, mercy. The world conquests, the fighting, the battles that they went through, Israel went through. We can see how that at times when Israel was so up against the wall, if you can, if I can say it that way, and yet God came through for them. It was, it was impossible militarily for them to win but yet God came through and they won the battles. So we can learn those narratives from those narratives that if God was for us, who could be against us? Amen? Praise God. Then we have significant events in God's dealing with his people. We see the fall of man. In that narrative of, uh, of, of uh, the fall of man, what was the one thing that, we, we, that sticks out there? A little help, maybe? What's the one thing that on the fall of man that sticks out in the story of uh, in, in Genesis? What's the one thing you could focus in on that? You could focus in on sin. You could 
focus on disobedience. You could you know, focus on rebellion. But the main narrative of that is, is that God provided a way and a covering. See, we have a tendency to always look to the negative, but in that story, in that narrative, God provided a covering for them. Even in that situation, even in that circumstance. Amen? And then we see the birth of Christ, I mean the establishing of covenants. With all the covenants we heard about when uh, Pastor Moffat was here, we talked about different covenants. So you can see the narratives in that. You can see the exodus when the children of Israel live, left Egypt, how God provided for them, right? And you can see how that even though they went through some battles, they still had Egypt inside of them. And from that narrative, God will show us that, yes, even though we're growing in Christ, we, we should be going, we should be moving toward the promised land, and we should be growing, and we should be letting those things that are Egypt be dead and away from us and uh, heading toward Canaan land. Amen? Then we have the history of Israel. We have the birth of the church. And then we have significant events in the life of, the, of key individuals in Scripture. I'll give you some examples, okay? Adam and Eve, right? Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph. You know, some people say, I don't like reading the Old Testament. They don't know what they're missing, okay? I'm, I love the Old Testament. But when you read it, read it as not just a story, but as a narrative, and read it so that you can get something out of it. <clears throat> I mean, Joseph was facing all kinds of obstacles. But why? Why did he go through so many things in his life? Was it because he had sin? No. It was because God gave him a dream. And any dream worth its salt is going to go through a death process. Uh, when Pastor... Uh, Andrew was here. He had mentioned about dream killers. Well, he got that from me because I, I preached that message in Nigeria a few years ago about dream killers and, uh, and how that when God gives you a dream, okay, God's going to allow that dream to die so that the whole significance of that dream or the whole outplaying of that dream is not going to be of your own selves, but it's going to be God. He's going to be the one that brings it to pass. He's going to be the one that's going to bring uh, the victory through that, through that process. And he wants us to get our hands off of it. And he wants us to, to just uh, allow him to fulfill that dream. And so you know what story with Joseph, he told his brothers... His brothers were envious of him, and they decided they were going to kill him. And one brother stood up and said, no, you can learn all about that. God always will have somebody who believes in you. Even if everybody forsakes you, even if everybody turns their back on you, okay, God always has someone who will believe in you. And his, his brother, one brother, said, no, we can't do that to him. That's not right. It's not. God will use that person in your life. So these are some of the things that you can get from reading the story. Don't just read it as a, as a history book, but read it with the, with the insight of what can I learn from the story of the narrative of Joseph? That even though he was falsely accused and he went to prison unjustified, he was in prison, and he wasn't, he wasn't supposed to be there. He didn't do anything wrong. So when bad things begin to happen, don't think it's always because something went wrong. It can be, okay, if, you, if there's things that you're not doing right. But beside that, if, if you're going through something, know that God has allowed it to, for a purpose. And I believe that God allowed that so that when, when God fulfills the purpose of that dream, no one gets the glory but him. Amen? Praise God. So we have Moses, we have David, we have Elijah, we have Jesus, we have Paul. Just reading the narrative of that and seeing, uh, to take for an example, Paul. You read the narrative of Paul, right? 
mean Pharisee uh, of the uh, you know of the Sanhedrin council. Some say yes, some say no. That's debatable. Okay, but it was a, persecu a, a persecutor of the church. He put some to death, put some in prison. He had a he had a, a in, he had a, a vendetta that he was going to destroy this way or this Christianity that was coming out of Israel. He was going to destroy it. He thought he was doing God a favor. But then something happened. In that narrative, he's walking down the road. Was it Damascus? And all of a sudden, a bright light shines from heaven, knocks him down to the ground, and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What that should tell each of us as we read that story is that when we come against the church for no reason, no good reason, we got to be careful because we're coming against him. Amen. All right? And so Paul, in, in, that, in that moment, gets converted. What does that tell you? How can we learn from that narrative that if Paul can get saved, anybody can get saved? No matter how wretched or miserable our family is, you know, when I think of different people that we know and we look at them and we go, man, it's impossible for that person to get saved. You know, you, some of us might be looking at some of our relatives, you know. Uh, Vicki, you might be looking at your brother, Louis, and say, man, that is one impossible case. Well, for God, it's not. It's not impossible with God. And God knows how to put the pressure on. You know? So we can learn these kind of things uh, from the narratives of the Bible. Narratives of the Bible are records of what took place, not necessary what should have taken place. This is one of the things that distinguishes the Bible from most other religious literature. The Bible makes no attempt to hide the weaknesses and sins of its principal characters. Isn't that amazing? When you read of David, and you see David, a man after God's own heart, but look what he did. God didn't hide that. So what, what's the narrative there? What, what do we learn from that? Nobody's perfect. Not even the king. Not even King David. And so we can learn from those principles. We can learn from those narratives. The Bible records Abraham's lies or half-truths told to Abimelech without Without comment. doesn't say anything about it. The Bible records David and Solomon's polygamy without consenting on it or condoning it. It is because of this fact that narratives at times can be instructive from either a positive viewpoint, what to do, or a negative viewpoint, what not to do. Give you another example. Abraham and Lot, they come together, they go, they got unity, right? Unity's great. Love unity. So Abraham and Lot get together and they start going to the uh, plains of, um, where is it? I forgot where it is. Where Lot and uh, Abraham went. I can't remember the place, but it was a Haran or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, I'm not an encyclopedia, so I don't have it right at the tip of my head. And I wasn't planning on talking about this. That's why. Otherwise, I would have looked up the information. Okay, and got the narrative. <laughs> All right. But Abraham and Lot come together, and then finally they're growing so much, and God's blessing them, and they're increasing, and they're prospering. So Abraham goes to Lot and says, hey, listen. Our herdsmen are fighting with your herdsmen because there's not enough room to feed every, all the animals and all this stuff. So you choose. So Lot looks around, and he sees the well-watered plains. And he, he doesn't say to himself, you know what? My uncle is older. I should respect him and give him the best. No. He just, I'm taking that. 
So he took that. But he didn't, what he didn't realize was that with the planes that he was looking at were well watered, even though it looked good, okay, it was pitched towards Sodom. So what do we get out of that narrative? Don't always go with what looks good. You see the principles you can learn that way from listening to the narrative? Okay. Narratives are usually incomplete or limited in that they do not contain anyone's full story, including Jesus. Nor do they cover any event in its entirety. In other words, you know, the scripture in the Bible says, and many more miracles did Jesus do, so many that if he was to do them, there's not enough books in the world that would contain them. Now, was that a literal thing? We've learned about this in interpretation. Or was it a hyperbolic expression? It was a hyperbolic expression. Think about it. All the books in the world, Jesus was only here for 33 years. Okay? So it's an expression of that the miracles were numerous or beyond counting. On their time. In this sense, any narrative may not answer all of the questions that we have are generated by the portion of the narratives that is recorded for us. Oftentimes there are big gaps between people like Adam and Noah or Noah and Abraham or Joseph and Moses. Many of these gaps can inspire questions that cannot be fully answered. One of the things we always come up against is where did Cain's wife come from? Because we think everything is chronological in the Bible, and it's not. Well, all the answers are there. There are many answers in the Bible, but not all of the answers are in there. Okay, God gave us what he wanted us to know. Okay. And so, um, inquiring minds, get in the word. And rather than becoming frustrated, we have to believe that God has given us enough to lead us to correct understanding of him and his purposes for our lives. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Do we have that, 1 Peter? A second Peter, rather, chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. Oh, by the way, the, the background of this photo is Tiberius in Israel. And Linda and I spent, uh, I think it was one night or two nights there, two nights in Tiberius. And I just read uh, the other day that Tiberius had a 3.2 earthquake, something like that. So things are getting shaken. He says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. Think about that. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace and peace through the knowledge of God. So if you need God's grace and you need peace, the more you know God, the more grace you'll get. The more you know God, the more peace you'll have. Amen? Because when you begin to read the narratives of how God was faithful, how God proved himself, how God stood with his people, how God backed his people, how God forgave his people, how God had mercy when he wanted to wipe them out, and Moses said, no, don't wipe them out because the Egyptians would say that you could not have delivered them. And so he, the Bible says he repented, meaning he changed his mind. And so you can see grace is multiplied, no, peace is multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and through the knowledge of Jesus our Lord. When you see the narrative of Jesus and the stories of Jesus, and you see how he depended on the Father, how he depended on the Father. He, he was so dependent on the Father. He said, even the words that I speak, they're not my own words. 
But the words that I hear the Father speak, that's what I speak unto you. He was that dependent on the Father for everything, for wisdom, for understanding, for knowledge. Everything, like the Bible says, that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Him. So if you lack wisdom, the Bible says, let Him ask, and it will give it, He'll be given to it liberally. God will give it to you. But it's, you've got to have an honest heart. You've got to have an open heart for that. You just can't go with your prejudged situation, already make, making the decision, and then going to God and say, God, give me your wisdom. God's going to laugh at you. Read, read Psalm. I mean, read Proverbs. That's the, book of, that's the book of wisdom. And it says, when you go and do your own thing, when you come back, he says, I'll laugh at you. Wisdom will laugh at you. Be too late. How do we seek wisdom? How do we seek knowledge? In the multitude of counselors, there's much wisdom. When you don't know something, find somebody that has wisdom. Amen. Find somebody that's gone down the road that you're, you're traveling. Find somebody that has made mistakes. They say in business... If you want to be successful, find somebody that's already successful in what you're trying to do and sit with them and talk with them and ask them about not their successes, but about their failures. What they did. How did they continue? What kept them going? Amen? Well, guess what? You can read that in the Bible. You can read about the, the, the failures of people that have failed God Miserably. Look at Peter. Failed God miserably. Denied Jesus. Cursed at him. Cursed saying, I don't even know the man. Blah, 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 blah. Think about that. Peter, the one that's, you know, that, oh, Lord, I'll die with you. But when it came down to the nitty-gritty, he turned his back on God. Think about the rejection he had. Think about the dejection he felt. Think about the enemy, Satan, coming to him and saying, yeah, you're no good. Look at that. You turned your back on the Savior. And because of you, he's going to be crucified. It's all your fault, Peter. And then Peter goes back. I'm giving you narratives here so you can know how to pick out these things. And then he goes back and he says, I go efficient. In other words, he's, he's turning his back on the call of God. He's discouraged. He's guilt-ridden. But then Jesus shows up. And he says, Peter, do you love me? There's hope for the hopeless. There's hope for those who feel like they failed God. You don't get that in a commentary. You get that from reading the Word and having fellowship with God through the Word and waiting upon God in the Word. And as you read the narrative, you begin to get all of these things and God begins to speak to you. It says, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. Next verse, please. According as his divine power hath given unto us. Does that include you? Huh? Does that include me? Yes. It included the author, who was Peter, who was, who was saying this. He said, he has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He's given it to us. How? Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Through the knowledge of him. He hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Every Sunday morning for years now, 
Every Sunday morning, Nelson stands right here. And he says these words. God, you are our Jehovah Jireh. You're our provider. Every Sunday. When you know God is your provider. The Bible talks about, don't say that when you, when you have gained wealth that your hands have done it. No, God has given you the power to create wealth. It's not because you have the great job. God got you the job. God gives you the ability to do the job. Think about it. Look at Moses. He tells Moses, go out and build a tabernacle. He's an Egyptian. I mean, he was raised in Egypt, right? What's a tabernacle? How am I going to build this thing? He said, build it according to the pattern that I will show you. Don't go build it according to what you think it should be. What can we learn from that? What's the narrative of that? What was the temple for? What was the, what was the tabernacle for? It would be the place where God dwells. Let's put that in the narrative to us. Where does God dwell? In us. Don't build this tabernacle according to the, your pattern of what you think, but build it according to the pattern that he has in Jesus Christ. Because according to his, his divine power hath given to us all things that pertain to life. There's not one Christian that should not be productive. There's not one Christian that should not have an abundance of life. And I'm not talking about material things. I'm talking about peace and joy and love and forgiveness, and grace, and mercy. All of the things that God has given to us. He said, freely you have been given, freely give. And godliness. What did he, how did he do that? Unto life and God. Through the power that had given unto us all things that pertain to life. Through the knowledge of him, Jesus, that he hath called us to glory and virtue. How do we obtain godliness? Through the knowledge of him. How does that make us godly? Because when we know him, and we know what he's done for us, and we know, knowing this, the Bible says, that our old man was crucified with him. He comes inside of us and he lives in us and he gives us a new nature. By the knowledge of him. Hallelujah. But the only way you're going to get the knowledge of him is if you read the word. The only way you're going to get to know him and know his ways and be able to sit down and take these narratives and Use them for interpreting. God. Man. Look at Jeremiah. This is what keeps me going all the time. Because God called me in the ministry out of Jeremiah. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I believe it was. He said, I'm sending you to a people who will not listen. Oh, gee, thanks, God. He says, and they'll look to you as one that plays well on an instrument and has a pleasant voice. That's what the scripture says. But they will not hear you. She thanks God. Am I in good company? Yep. Now, that doesn't mean everyone's not going to hear you. No, that doesn't mean that. But the majority won't hear you. He says, and let them know that when this thing happens, that they will know there was a prophet among them. They did the same thing to Jesus. He said, marvel not. If they hated me, they'll hate you. That's why I don't feel all bad and sad when people don't like you, especially if you're bringing light to a dark place. 
It ain't you they hate. It's the light. Why do you think the left is going so crazy? Why do you think they're so adamant and so angry? Over oh, Donald Trump with a, with a weird haircut? Think about it. He's just a guy. I mean, you know, why are they so angry? You know why they're angry? Because they, they're afraid that the advances that they've made in the area of the judicial system and abortion is now getting threatened to be illegal. If he appoints another conservative that will con interpret the, the Constitution the way it was meant to be interpreted, they're getting nervous because now he's in favor of Christianity and not having prejudice against Christianity. Light is starting to be exposed again. Light is starting to come back again. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And that's why they're angry. Why would somebody go up to somebody and spit in their face all because they have a hat that says make America great again? Think about it. No matter what side you're on, I mean, don't you want America to be great? <laughs> but there are some that don't. It's that spirit. Go to the next one. Whereby I given, say given, unto everyone else but me. Is that what it says? What does it say? Whereby given unto us, now watch these words now, exceeding great and precious promises. Whereby is given unto us exceeding great, exceeding greatness. Exceeding great. Not just mediocre. Not just okay. Exceeding great and precious promises. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. In other words, when Jesus said the words, I and me and you and you and me and I and you. And that we can lean on him. We can depend on him. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will come and he'll be with you. He shall be in you. He shall be upon you. He shall lead you. He shall guide you. He will not speak of his own, but that which he hears, that shall he speak. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I don't do anything except the Father of what he says, and then I do it. Well, we're not Jesus, but God says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost. He's going to lead you, and he's not going to speak of his own, but what he hears of the Father, he's going to speak, it, and what he hears from me, he's going to speak to you. Are you getting that? I hope so. And he says, be in partakers of the divine nature, having escaped. Look at that word, escaped. What, when you see that word, what does it mean to you? It means that somebody that was in a position of real harm or danger or someone who was bound and imprisoned. You have escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. Do you understand that that's what you escape from? You escape from that. All of these narratives that I'm telling you tonight, look at verse 3. We have everything we need to live a life that pleases God. Look at verse 3 again. We have everything we need. Can you look at the NLT version?
By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him, the one who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. Praise God. Now, narratives do not necessarily teach doctrine directly, but indirectly. The narratives are a great way to illustrate doctrinal truths that are covered in other parts of the Bible. In other words, one could look at the life of Joseph to see the truth of, of flea sexual immorality, which is found in the New Testament in Corinthians. So if you read in Corinthians, flea sexual immorality, you go, well, how do I do that? Go back and read about Joseph. Right? Here's Joseph. Do, 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 going into Potiphar's wife's bedroom. Okay? First of all, that should have rang a bell. <laughs> okay? And then he's caught. And now he has a decision. Either she's going to lie about it if he doesn't do what she says, or he's going to flee and take the, take the consequences. A lot of people would have just said, well, you know what? I better go along with it because I'm going to get in trouble if I don't. Come on. But he fled, leaving his garment behind. So these are some of the narratives that you can read about and take truth from. Narratives of the Bible are preserved for us to teach us about how God relates to man, how man is to relate to God, and how man can better enter into and fulfill the ultimate purposes of God for his life or her life. One of the most significant things that the narratives teach us about God has to do with God's providential hand in the lives of his people. Here's, here's, I'm going to tell you how God knows everything. Okay. Yesterday morning, about 3, 3.45, my phone rings. Not my phone here, my house phone. I answer it, hello? Is this the chaplain? This is the fa Faven Fire Department. I said, yes. They said, they need you at this address in Fairhaven. I said, okay, I'll be there. So I get dressed, I go there. Go in the house, the man had passed away. He was 70 years old. So I get in there and I'm I'm, I'm in there, and I'm comforting the wife. You know, they were married 47 years. He was 70 years old. They, were married. they met at 16. And it's so funny because how they met was they were at a drive-in, Howdy Beef Burger on Purchase Street. Many of you know where that was? Okay. And she was with her boyfriend and her girlfriend and, and her boyfriend in the car. Well, you know, back then you ordered your food, and they went, and they audit it, then they brought it to you. Well, while they were waiting for the food, you know, as teenagers sometimes do, they were making out in the back seat. So after they ate, you know, they came and they got their food and they ate and stuff like that. The girlfriend's uh, date said to, said to um, this girl, wipe the back window because it's all fogged up. So she wiped the back window. Well, this guy that died thought she was waving at him. And so when they pulled out, he followed her. Now, back then, that was safe to do. Okay? And so when she got home, he got out of the car and said, what do you want? And she goes, what? What are you talking about? He said, you were waving at me. She says, no, I was cleaning the window. And they started to talk, and then they dated, and a year later, they got engaged, and two years later, they got married, and they've been married ever since. But here's the kicker. So I walk into this situation, and, you know, and I'm asking her the question, how did you guys meet, you know, trying to get her mind off of things a little bit. And I notice that she's wearing a shirt that says Titleist on the sleeve. So I said, um, 
I noticed you have a shirt with titles on it. Did you work there? She said, yeah. I said, where did you work? She said, custom. I said, I worked in custom for 12 years. She looked at me. She looked at my eyes. She says, Bob. She says, I know you. That's so-and-so. I worked with him in the glove department. And the guy's sister, I worked with her. And they looked at me and they said, you're the chaplain? I said, yeah. She said, my husband always spoke well of you. What a nice guy you were when you, when you worked with him. Coincidence? I had my phone on vibrate. That's why they called my phone, but I didn't hear it. So they call my home phone. And I got to talk with them. And, and the nephew that was there was very close to him. He was just crying. He said, you don't know what your presence here means. We're so thankful that you're here. And I just let them talk. And just was just the presence of being there, representing God. Now, God knew about this eons ago. But to be in the providential will of God like that is amazing. I mean, it, that blows my socks off. I don't know about you. When, you. when things like that happen, that is amazing. And that's what I'm saying to you tonight. Narratives of the Bible are history, but they are more than history. What are the values? I just need about 10 more minutes. What is the values of pur our, our purpose of narratives? Well, first, the narrative provides an account of God's redemptive plan for man worked out in history. You can see it all the way through the Bible. The narratives help us to see history through God's eyes. Ultimately, the purpose of this is to help us to see the way that God sees. What we sometimes don't think sin is sin, God says it is. Well, I don't see nothing about making a calf and worshiping it. <laughs> Look at it from God's perspective. The narrative provides examples of us, of other men and women of faith whom, from whom we can draw strength from. Hebrews chapter 11. They can be an impartation of faith just by reading about the lives of these great heroes of faith like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That when you go through the fire, understand that there's a fourth man in that fire with you. That you're not alone. Come on, somebody. The narratives provide visual illustrations of divine truth. People often learn more readily when they have varied experiences with the truth. Narratives provide the visual outworking of much of the de declared truth found in the Bible. That when a man, such as the paralytic that couldn't get up when, it, when the water was troubled, okay, that when you come to the end of yourself and you just can't seem to get the answers, when you rely upon God, God will give you the answer. Amen? The narratives allow the readers to put themselves into the lives of others and gain understanding for application for their own lives. What process is involved in interpreting the narratives? Well, first of all, you have to seek to understand the natural setting of the narrative. You gotta know what, what, what was it like? Where were they? Were they in Egypt? Were they were Mesopotamia? Were they, where were they? Find out the region, find out the gods that they worship, find out the, the narrative of the people there. And you can get the ideology of where they're coming from. Like when it came out of Egypt, all the things. Why, why was it so easy for them to go back and, and say to Moses, you know, were, were we to die in the wilderness, it was better if we served Egypt. Why? Because it didn't threaten their security. Hello? At least in Egypt, yeah, they were in bondage, but they were secure. They knew they were going to get fed. 
The narrative assists the New Testament believer in learning from the positive examples of the mistakes of others. When you read about the Bible and you see that the different mistakes that other people have made, don't make the same mistake. <laughs> That's where wisdom comes in. The narratives can be a tool to help people remember important spiritual lessons. Children as well as adults can benefit from the narratives in this way. What process is involved in interpreting the narrative? Seek to understand the natural setting of the narrative. This in includes understanding the historical setting of the narrative. And this includes such things as specific places, as we talked about, geography, objects, activities, customs, social values, pol the politics, world events, etc. Learn a little bit about that. If you don't know, Google it. <laughs> Google will be very helpful. This includes understanding the various characters involved in the narrative. Remember the story of Esther and, and uh, Naaman? And, and uh, what was the guy that they hung? Haman? Learn, read that story. It's very interesting how somebody was uh, promoting themselves, promoting themselves, promoting themselves, putting down somebody out, and how in the end God vindicated him and hung him. He wanted to have him hung and, and you know, I mean, you can learn some valuable lessons there of how to de develop character. This also includes the plot line and how this narrative fits into God's plan for the ages. Seek to understand the plot of the narrative in question. And to do this, you will have to read the account in its entirety, including that which comes before it, that which follows it, and other parallel accounts of the same event. Remember how we told you scripture, interpreting scripture? That's what you want to do. You want to be able to look at those things. As you read, you will be asking certain questions that will help you to better understand what is actually happening. I think these are in your book. Who are the principal characters? How are they related to each other? What is the flow of the action? Who is acting and upon, who is acting and upon whom is the action being made? What is the point of the conflict or tension? When I read that, I, and I don't have this in my notes, but these are things that I feel inspired by God to talk about. When, uh, when Jacob and Esau finally came to meet, Jacob was fearful. Okay? Now here comes Esau, and he thinks, oh, my brother's going to kill me. I mean, this is it. He's going to kill me. What do we see in the story? Even though Jacob had fear, he still approached his brother. And that at times, you're going to be in a situation, you're going to be, find yourself in a circumstance where you're going to have a little bit of fear, but don't let fear stop you. Don't let fear, you know, paralyze you. Just go forward because you don't, you know, some people say, well, he's never going to forgive me, so therefore I'm not going. Yes. What's that? Yeah, he approached him with gifts, Okay. Okay, so what you can learn from that is you can't buy your way out of some things, okay? He was trying to bribe him was what he was trying to do, okay? Okay? But instead of his brother killing him, his brother forgave him. There's narratives there that you and I can learn some real valuable lessons. Amen? Uh, such as, how does the event relate to what's gone, what's gone on before, to what follows? Is there anything in the recording of this event that reflects God's attitude toward the person or the action? Are there any other verses that shed light on the passage? Seek to discover what issues, personal, religious, social, political, economic, are at play in the narrative. Seek to understand any key unique words that are used by the writer to record this event. We talked about that right? exceedingly above those words when you see that exceedingly precious promises exceedingly precious promises that means beyond the precious promises god is faithful who has promised he will do it amen if god promised it he's going to do it apply that to the past of your life when you went through things when you go through things 
And I remember when Annie came and Tom wasn't with us. He went to the garden alone. <laughs> That's where he was on Sundays, out in his garden. <laughs> okay. And she'd come to me and she'd cry and say, oh, I want a godly husband. Let's, I said, just pray he's coming. He's going to come. Don't worry. He's coming. So you already mocked, brother. You had no, you know, you were a mocked man. And so we prayed and, 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 and we, I said, God, if he, what he promised, he promised. You know, and, and he promised. And guess what? See the fulfillment of that. Let that, but let that narrative, that story, that personal experience that you've gone through help to build your faith in other areas. That where God kept you when he led you and he kept you and he led you to an, a new place. Just have faith. God, okay, you're leading me to this place. You're going to provide for me. You're my Jehovah Jireh. Amen? Seek to find God in the narrative. Remember that God is still the central subject of the Bible and every portion of Scripture should communicate to us something about God and his redemptive in interaction with mankind. God is the hero of all biblical narratives. Even in the book of Esther, where God's, God, God is never mentioned specifically, God is the hero behind the scene. Seek to determine what part of the narrative has meaning for us today. Each individual episode within a particular narrative does not necessarily have a moral all of its own. Its primary meaning may come from the wider context from which the narrative is extracted. What are some cautions when it comes to interpreting the narrative? I'm going to end with this. There are some cautions that the interpreter must be aware of when interpreting the narrative portions of the scripture. Number one, do not seek a symbolic interpretation of a natural event unless the Bible itself instructs us to do so. 1 Corinthians, uh, you, I'm just going to give you the, the reference. You don't have to look it up now. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 11. Might be in your book. Number two, understand that most but not all narrative material is presented in a chronological or sequential way. It's not always in a sequential, chronological way. There is, I think his name is Reese. He has a, the chronological Bible of the, in, in the Old Testament. And every, every book that's, that he puts, that he makes this Bible in, it's all in sequential order, the right order, how it took place. First Kings, Second Kings, Samuel, Second Samuel, because the stories that that didn't happen at that time, it happened before that time. But he puts it all together and he brings it in a sequential way. Good book. The events of Genesis one to three are not necessarily presented in the sequence. Many of the events of the life of Jesus, as presented in the Gospel, are not necessarily in a chronological order. All of the events recorded occurred in his life, but not necessarily in the exact order in which they are presented. Focus on what narrative says, not on what you want the narrative to say. Focus on what it says, not what you want it to say. In other words, make sure that you apply all of the biblical principles of interpretation that you've learned so far to the narrative as well. Amen? Any questions? Did you enjoy that tonight? I did. I'll party all by myself. Praise God. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you, God. I pray that, Father, you would help us to look for these narratives in the scriptures and, and learn and pull the lessons that can be applied to our hearts and our life. Father, we thank you for tonight, and I thank you, Father, for everyone that came out tonight, even though many probably are tired, many worked all day today, but still they pushed through and they came. Father, I give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise. Bless those who could not be here tonight that have good reasons for not being here tonight. And, Father, those that don't have good reasons, I pray that you just, you, you just talk to them. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. In Jesus' name, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Give us traveling mercies as we go and be with us the rest of this week till we meet on Sunday morning. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.